Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 813. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a landing page, a gallery... I need all those things, Chris, but I, I don't know if I can pay full price. Well, then maybe you should uh, get 10% Whoa, that your sounds first great. purchase. How do I go do to that? Squarespace. You go to squarespace.com and enter the promo code NERDIST. Oh, it's so easy. It is. Everything you might need. Maybe if you want a blog, if you want an online store... And I got to make sure that my computer doesn't autocorrect to nerdiest. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's actually did autocorrect to nerdist, and I felt vindicated in some way. I don't know if it's still. Well, you just have to punch in you nerdist have to punch it in enough a lot. times, yeah. and then eventually, maybe it was mine. So make sure, kids, that if you're doing it, don't let autocorrect ruin your discount code. Start your free trial today. Go to squarespace.com and the promo code nerdist. Get ten percent off your first purchase. Squarespace, set your website apart. Uh, do you have a corkboard, a Nerdist Community corkboard? Yeah, I, I got a couple things. So Paul Valentine writes, my wife, who doesn't know that he was sending this email, recently started a, de- a decorated cookie business called A Double Batch. She sells really awesome looking decorated cookies, and for each cookie she sells, she donates one to someone in the community in need. She recently uh, took a batch of over 100 paint-your-own cookies to a children's hospital. They're in Oklahoma City, and because of state regulations on selling food from your home, she can only take local orders. But, you know, if, if they get more orders and they are able to get a permit to sell to everywhere, she can send cookies all across the country. So OKC Nerdist fans, get some cookies. Yeah. Oh, they look so good. So you can go to their Facebook and her Instagram. It's a double batch. And uh, you can look at the cookies, and they look amazing. The decorations are great, and they look delicious. So definitely Fantastic. check that out. And then also Annie Heath writes... I'm shaving my head to raise money for childhood cancer, and also because it's really hot in Los Angeles right now. And um, Well, it's just an added benefit. <laughs> she writes, childhood cancer is extremely underfunded, so she decided to do something about it for by raising money for cures. And now she needs everyone, uh, all the nerds community help. And she's asking people to make a donation, even $1, to help out. She's trying to raise at least $1,000 if more... You know, maybe more if she can. And if you go to org slash participants slash Annie O'Heath. And that's B-A-L-D-R-I-C-K-S. Baldricks. Annie yeah. O'Heath. O- Annie O'Heath. St. Baldricks. H-E-A-T-H. Yeah. Yes. Great. Good job, Annie O'Heath. Way to go, Annie. Do you want to promote something on the corkboard for you, Matt? No. <laughs> love, love, check, check, check out the Nerdist Podcast. Want to promote your new car that you got? I don't want to promote it. I'd like Volvo to promote me. <laughs> <laughs> what card? What card do you Matt, get? Matt's been bucking for a Volvo, a free Volvo for. I mean, I don't know now. what. I don't know how many times I have to talk about how great. <laughs> did you get the Volvos SUV? Are. I don't know. I don't know how much what I have to get? discuss the wonders of Swedish engineering. Well, because you're giving away the milk for free, Matt. I know. You know, and that's just the thing. I'll keep talking about it, even though they haven't yet uh, given <laughs> One me of a these days, Volvo knock off a Volvo. monthly payment or something. <laughs> Volvo Financial Services. I don't know. Figure I it like out. the sponsorships turn into a plea for. Just give me a Volvo. Give me a fucking thing. No, I'm just that. Listen, I'll, I'll even. I'll take a golf shirt. Dude, if anyone wants to send me free it? shit too, I like stuff. I'm excited send about the scout this. stuff. I'm excited about the yeah. Send dog stuff to scout. Uh, what if Volvo's like? Uh, we sent the Volvo to scout. <laughs> <laughs> like Matt didn't get it. Matt like, didn't that's, even get a keychain. That's great. Uh, I'm excited about today's podcast. It's a guy by the name of Hakeem Olushei, and uh, he is on a show called Outrageous Acts of Science. Uh, I've been wanting to have more science educators on the podcast. He's a fan. He's another one of these. Uh, he's another one of these guys that can take complex scientific uh, uh, concepts and then just translate them for everyday folks like you and me uh, who may not have a degree in astrophysics. Uh, but he's such not a smart yet. guy. No, not yet. Outrageous Acts of Science is on Science Channel Wednesdays at 9 p.m. and you should watch it uh, and follow Hakeem. Uh, but he's a super cool guy and, and crazy, crazy smart. And uh, he's on today's Nerdist podcast. And he yeah, flew he's out just to do the podcast. What? He's a TED Talk. And they're great. Uh, That's excessive. He flew out just to do the podcast? Yes. Wow. Thanks, Akeem. <laughs> it was worth it. It was absolutely worth it. This, uh, this episode was brought to you by Stamps.com. He could have put a bunch what? of stamps on himself and mailed himself to do the podcast because... Well, Chris, how would he know how much he weighed and how much postage he owed? Well, because you can get a digital scale what? from Stamps.com, Oh, Matt. my God. How much would uh, I have to pay for that scale? Uh, well, it is a $110 bonus a offer, but you're not paying $110, Wait, Matt. what? You get the postage, you get the digital scale, you go to Stamps.com, use the promo code NERDIST for that special offer, and then everything from 
from your desk or wherever your computer is. You can buy and print out the exact official U.S. postage. Wow. And then send. Keep it in your bathroom. Keep it in your bathroom if you want to. Like, I don't think you can. Like I don't think you can ship a human being uh, via the postal service. Well, I mean, we just haven't tried yet. Well, I'm not I sure. How, we, I don't know how much that scale will go up to. I'm not sure. So we're, I'm not sure we're able to do that. Perhaps infants. You can mail infants, probably. I don't think you can mail a baby. Katie, can you mail a baby? It'll fill on the scale. You can mail it. Legally, that's allowed. Fill on the scale. You can mail it. Think I'm not sure that's the rule. Sure they'll, they'll like uh, you know rescue or something. I'm not sure that's the rule, but we'll go to stamps.com. To save some money. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Nerdist. That's stamps.com. Enter the promo code Nerdist. Do not mail yourself or a baby. I guess not. Don't be dumb like Matt. I'm not. Well. <laughs> I mean, that should just be a drop we play every 20 minutes on this show. That should show. be a ring. Someone should isolate that and make that a ring Don't tone. be dumb like that. <laughs> the Myra method. Sound like remember my the Myra method? Wife talking to my dog. Remember the Myra method? Uh, I do. I remember very well. You still haven't written that yet. You still got to write the Myra method. There's a lot I got to write, Chris. Here's the Nerds Podcast number 813 with Hakeem Olushe. Now entering Nerdist.com. Church. Oh yeah. yeah! What a crazy! Qu- I honestly <laughs> didn't plan on. I just wore yeah. my boy. I wore my Voyager one line. shirt. Yeah. Hey, literally, man. Where I lived in in Florida, my condo, I'd sit on my couch and watch everything take off. Right in the condo. Oh, that's fantastic. Did yeah. you? Was that? Did was that by design? It was not by design. I moved there. I'm sitting on my laptop. On the couch, I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, this is what's going on. <laughs> I wonder if yeah. somewhere there's some uh, alien who's using this disc to DJ at some space <laughs> rave. I would, yeah. I would imagine. Uh, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the show. I, I, I'm always I, – I, I always want to be able to use this platform to bring on educators who are able to take very complex scientific concepts and then relay them to just – People like me, just like regular yeah, folks yeah. Who, who are trying to wrap their minds around the yeah. largely incomprehensible. It's comprehensible, man. Okay. It's definitely comprehensible. Let's try to yeah, comprehend yeah, yeah, some yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, First yeah. of all, yeah. um, did uh, did Neil Tyson make – was he kidding or did he make a comment about – I'm very interested in this idea in the universe being some type of a, uh, a program that's running, like some type of a – yeah, I mean, people make they they just say that kind of stuff to be provocative. You it's think not, so? Oh, I know hundred hundred percent. No, so right? okay. there's no evidence whatsoever, right? You know, what is true is what we observe to be true. No one's observed. That's that what they true. thought in the Matrix. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's what they thought. <laughs> they didn't know. Yeah. But you know what? Truth is always stranger than fiction when it comes to the universe. So what's really happening is you know. Yet to be discovered, right? You right. Know, there's really cool awesomeness yet to be discovered because we're getting hints of, you know, what we don't know based on how much we do know. Which and what are some of the things that we've learned even okay. just this year? Yeah. So, for example, so uh, well, not this year, but you know, it, it's a build up. So people used to think back in the day, right, that uh, every wave required a medium to propagate it, right? Waves in water, waves in air, waves on a string. And so people thought that, hey, space must be something because light travels to us from stars. So it's got to be it's got to be like a water and a ripple. Yeah, something like that. That's, that's propagating. But then there was this famous experiment called the Michelson-Morley experiment, which seemed to show, OK, this doesn't exist. And that's something we call the ether. Mm-hmm. Right. So it doesn't exist. But then Einstein comes along and Einstein is like, well, you know, space bends, it stretches, it expands, it contracts. So something is doing something. Right. And now we have gravitational waves, which were just just discovered. Right. Which are ripples in space. Right. Lengths change as these waves pass by. But then there's the other thing that Einstein discovered, which is quantum entanglement. Right. And so what is space? Space is what separates here from there. Okay, And so if any two things interact, then something must traverse the distance between them Mm -hmm. in order to send that signal. But for quantum entangled, you know, particles, they react to each other instantly. 
as if across distances. Yeah, no matter how far separated they are. Right. So space is is, is as if space is not separating them, right? Mm-hmm. And even quantum mechanically, if we look at say an electron changing energy levels, you could think of the energy level in, in, in one way is how close it is to the nucleus. So it can go from one location to another location without ever being anywhere in between, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, all these things are saying, you know, our macroscopic concept of space doesn't really capture what space is. Do, can our brains even process what space is? You know, that's an interesting question. I read a book by a cognitive scientist that really... Uh, had me kind of pissed off for a little while. Okay. And the reason why is because the book argued that every concept that we have, every descriptive thing that we have, even mathematics, are go back to being interpreted through the language of our five senses. And so the human description is a uniquely human description. We think, okay, mathematics will be the same no matter where you are in the universe. Right. But our math, our human mathematics is a human mathematics. So that means then that there very well may be thoughts that we cannot comprehend, right? We don't know what they are yet, and so let's try to comprehend them all. <laughs> and did you not, you, you didn't agree with this? Well, listen, I found it pretty convincing, right? But I didn't follow up and read more on the Because it really does sort of feel like there are concepts that are so large that it's kind of like, kind of like expecting your dog to understand Game of Thrones, or it's yeah, just like they uh, just don't have that layer of brain yeah. to be able to process all of yeah. these things and perceive them in a way that they would need to be perceived. But we have something at our disposal. For example, you can't imagine higher dimensions, really, right? You can't envision it. You're, right. you're stuck in our 3D or 4D, if you include time, way of thinking. But mathematically, we can describe it. Right, right to, to infinite dimensions. So we have these tools that can allow us to describe the incomprehensible. Right. So does that mean it's incomprehensible? We're describing it, even though we our minds can't envision it. So you, how long have you been hosting television shows? So my uh, first hosting gig happened about four years ago. Okay, in twenty twelve. Yeah, yeah. And you and is that is has that been show been run is Outrageous Acts been running the Outrageous Acts about this card started second season, or well Outrageous Acts started after that show so this show that show was kind of like a one off that I did and okay. uh, it showed people that hey you know because because I'd actually been involved with uh, television in the background for several years before that. And people thought, hey, you know, you might be a good guy to put on camera. But, you know, people have in mind a uh, sort of a perspective of what a scientist looks like, sounds like, and and this sort of thing. And so it was difficult to envision me in, in – It's the... supposed to be Michio Kaku? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, Brian Cox. You know, there was this idea that you – you know, you're deep and you're, you know, you're wordsmith and you talk funny. And I'm so intelligent I talk funny, right? right. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't that guy. I'm kind of regular, right? And uh, – Finally, uh, this producer, gave, you know, he I, I, I did this one show. It was it was uh, Discovery had this thing called Curiosity, mm-hmm. right? And there was this um, show about alien invasions. Are we ready? And I taped it, and the show was maybe a couple of hours. I don't know, an hour or a couple of hours. It was hosted by Michelle Rodriguez, mm-hmm. right? Right. And uh, I was the first person on after Michelle, and then after that, I might I, I might have been on the show for like a minute. In right. total. But at the end of the taping, the producer says, he's like, Hakeem, you're really good at this, man. Why don't you do it more often? And, you know, I was like, hey, you tell me. <laughs> why, why, right? And so they called me back, you know, like several months later. And they're like, hey, man, we're doing this other show. How would you like to be in it? And by the way, we can't pay you. Right. And I and I had been advised, you know, by someone who was advising me, like, Hakeem, you're wonderful. If they see you, it's going to work out for you. Right. So right. get out there. Right. And so I said, okay, this is an opportunity for me to get out there. I go and tape the show. The show, you know, hits, and there's a spinoff series. And I didn't know it, but I was like the main host of the show, right? <laughs> yeah, it's now on Netflix. I'm not going to mention it because it's on a competitive network now. Okay, but. gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's how it happened, right? But not but, hard to find if you yeah, know how yeah. to use a search field. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I think uh, because you're a, uh, I know that uh, you teach at F- at Florida Institute Technology. Well, I had been until recently. Did I you left, Did you left? You left. I, I left. On a sabbatical to go to MIT, and I've been research only since. Okay, then. yeah. And how's it been going in MIT? Well, you know, MIT is MIT. Research is research. You know, it's <laughs> so everything goes well. But you know, when you're in the trenches, right? You're trying to make things work. You're trying to make things happen. And and uh, you know, the way these projects are, you um, you know, you, you're it, it always whenever you're developing technologies or doing analysis. 
as you're going through the process, it feels like you're failing all the time, <laughs> right? It, it, it really does, right? You know, you work on something, you're trying to make it work in the lab, or you're trying to make your software work, and you're beating your head on the wall, you know, and then it works. Right, you're like great, but now you have something else to do. Right, right? that's tough. Yeah, that's really just, tough. You, you yeah. built the thing so that you can get to the next stage of rejection. <laughs> so you get to the next stage, and then you build, yeah, and, you yeah, build yeah. and you build and you build and you build. And then uh, you launch, hope it doesn't blow up on the launch pad, gets into space. You hope it doesn't fail immediately in space. And then when it works, you know, you're just like, oh my goodness. But from the start date to that date is typically a long time. What is yeah. what does your lab need to have? If yeah. someone says, hey, we're going to give you a lab and to do the work yeah. that you need to do, yeah. what are the things that you ask for? Well, it, it depends, right? So I basically am researching in multiple areas. So one area that um, I've been working on with my students. So we've been publishing work in uh, – so I do this astrophysics cosmology work that – uses what we call survey science. So in the old days, right, you, you have a telescope, you point at an object you're interested in, you take data on that object. Today, we're doing science in a time domain. So the telescope automatically images a re- several regions of the sky every night. Then it goes back the next night and does it again, does it again, and does it again, and does it again, until you have a movie. Right. of that region of the sky. And so there are things that change with time. There are stars that pulsate. There are planets passing in front of stars. And so with that type of data, we can do different types of science. So I'm doing that sort of science. The other thing I'm doing, which is what I've been doing you know, from the beginning of my career, is studying the interactions of plasmas and electric and magnetic fields. And the laboratory for doing that is the surface of the sun. right? And so one thing that happened is that one of my graduate students, who's now a doctor, he recognized that we can use the technique that the sun uses to accelerate particles to create a propulsion technique, right? Our top ion propulsion technique um, accelerates particles to 50 kilometers per second. The sun accelerate, accelerates particles to over 3,000 kilometers per second. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Now, of course, that's a lot of kinetic energy, so you got to get the energy from somewhere. So what we've done is... Ah, uh, math. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we're at the prototyping fa- f- phase now, right? So we, we've designed the two key parts computationally. Um, and so now it turns out that the software that you would use, there's an off-the-shelf software that you would use to model this sort of thing. Our problem is too computationally difficult for it. So we'd have to build it from the ground up. So I need uh, money to do that computational effort as well as to build the small prototype, which is pretty inexpensive. The prototype is pretty inexpensive, less than 100000 but the computational effort might cost a bit more. Well, so what does that mean in practical terms? Does it just mean literally that we can go places 60 times faster than we could before? <clears throat> yeah, and that's great, right? If you want to go to Mars instead of taking two years, right? Take a much a, a few months or a few weeks. That's, that's you might actually different. be able to come back. Yeah, right. Or <laughs> <laughs> if they don't leave you there, right. And then uh, if your crew doesn't abandon you, <laughs> and then there's um, you know traveling to a nearby star, right. We, we we'd also want to do that. Now, uh, what is the closest? What 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 star has the closest habitable zone near it? Well, you know, we just there was a star recently discovered. Uh, it was just announced in the last few days. It's a it's a small ultra cool dwarf um, that has three planets in its what, two are certainly in its habitable zone. And uh, the thing about it though, they orbit their star, their years are something like on a scale of two or three days. Okay. Right? And then the third uh, planet, you know, its orbit isn't quite as well defined, so it could be up to uh, you know, it could be inside the habitable zone or outside the habitable zone. Um, then there's the Alpha Centauri system, right. which has planets. Um, so, you know, the thing to do is just to go to any other star. So you go to, to the closest one, which would be the Alpha Centauri system, right? Visit Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri and just see these planets around other stars. That would be a huge uh, step forward. Is it, is it, is it really um, does it, is there an adjustment period when you're studying this kind of big science, when you're studying cosmology, and you, you see the what seems like incalculable amount of things in the universe, and you go, we are so insignificant in the grand scheme of everything. Yeah, well, you know what? It, it, it's yes and no. So it, understanding your place is important, and you know that is one perspective. Another way of looking at it is that if you look at the evolution of the universe and uh, what's happened. So we have, this, we have what we call the cosmological principle, and a consequence of the cosmological principle is that everything is made of the same stuff everywhere. The universe is homogeneous, and there's no preferred directions, right? It's, it's, it's isotropic. So everything is the same everywhere, right? But every time is not identical, right? And so as time moves forward, things come together under the influence of the fundamental forces, uh, you know, 
the you know just like an object will fall to earth under the influence of gravity to minimize the gravitational potential energy right things are coming together structure is building and so things emerge that did not exist before right so planets you know so you start off with just protons and electrons next you have atoms and then you end up with stars and planets right and molecules and then you get life right then you get intelligent life and what's next right so we are a step along the universe fulfilling this destiny whatever that may be and are you? Do you have any ideas about what might be next? <clears throat> I don't. But it seems like the universe values certain things, right? <clears throat> For example, diversity. If you take any any identical system and you isolate it, right? They 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 will evolve along divergent paths, right? Right. And so the universe is set up to be diverse. And if you look at life on Earth, it seems like the universe is selecting. So there are these stars that live for extremely long time periods, but you know, our sun isn't one of them, right? It only lasts about 10 billion years and it's about halfway done. And what happens is, is that periodically life is wiped off the earth. You know, we have these mass extinctions. So it's as if the universe is saying, okay, here you go. Evolve. All right. You haven't made it to leave your planet yet. We're going to wipe you out and start over. Okay. (laughs) All right. All right. You have us. Right. And so the clock is ticking. Right. So for us, you know, we have to leave the planet in order to extend infinitely into the future. Right. And uh, if we don't, we're going to go extinct. But listen, our generation is very um, fortunate in the sense that we have fossil fuels available to us, right? Future generations may not have as much energy available to do this. So it's like the leaky roof problem, right? Okay, our planet works now. There's no reason to, to fix the roof, right? But then the sun is going to rain one day, and it's going to rain comets and asteroids. And, right. You know, the sun's going to expand into a red giant, right? So, you know, if if you leave your planet and colonize in space, then you will continue forever, and if not, you will go extinct unless you live around one of these small stars, right, which lasts for a trillion years or so. Gosh, I, you know, I, I still think that's a convincing argument that we're a simulation and that we're a simulation <laughs> on some alien's de- – some higher consciousness <laughs> desktop. This is like, yeah. oh, let's see which one's going to make it off the planet. Oh, yeah. no, I didn't make it off the planet. I mean it, it really it, – it is yeah. that kind of uh, – it's a race. It really is a race. But I always yeah. wonder like, you know, maybe the race isn't necessarily – you know, not not putting our physical bodies out into the universe, but if there's a way, you know, maybe we're developing, maybe there's some kind of Kurzweil type thing where we're able, whatever to, that is, where we're able to <laughs> upload our consciousness into, oh, yeah, a, into, yeah. you know, like yeah. our consciousness becomes uh, some kind of a, a, a program or, or or a software that we're able to. Yeah. Shoot, yeah, that, exactly. That, that shoots yeah, out into, right, right. into space, and that's one of the ideas about colonizing space is that we actually send out embryos and robots, right? That like measure because here's the other thing: we are evolved to to exist in this particular environment, right? This particular pressure, this particular pH, this particular atmospheric composition. No other planet is going to be identical, right? And when you get there, you won't have time to evolve to survive in those conditions. So we're going to have to bioengineer ourselves. So what does that mean, right? What does it mean to be human? Are we going to like send embryos and then bioengineer them to survive in that particular environment, right? But also if we think about what the universe is doing, here's another take on it. Maybe the universe is exists to produce light and humans are just life is just another way of producing more light. Cause think about it. If you look at the evolution of the universe, the first thing that happens is you have this early era of matter, anti-matter annihilation, right? And it just produces all these photons, right? That ultimately will constitute the cosmic microwave background radiation. Then you have helium recombination, right? Helium ion, uh, ions capture two electrons. And when those electrons move to a lower electric potential, they give off light. Then later you have hydrogen recombination. And when they do that, so this is the universe going, so first when the nuclei form, that's the universe going neutral, neutral under the strong force gives out all these gamma rays. Then when helium and hydrogen recombination occur, that's the universe going neutral under the electromagnetic force mm-hmm. and all these photons are produced. The universe is still going neutral under the force of gravity. Things are still collapsing and what is all the matter doing? It's just getting squeezed and just pouring out light, right? In the form of stars. And then for those ones that aren't, um, you know, Jupiter gives off more light than it receives Saturn. You know, the Jovian planets do this. And then for these small rocky planets like the Earth, Right. If life forms, then we'll create more right. light to give off, right? <laughs> so the number of photons in the universe increases with time. 
So you're right. saying the universe exists to create Vegas? No, I don't know. I'm just checking out what it basically, uh, pretty much, right? <laughs> We've done a, Vegas. We are Vegas fulfills yeah. the universe's so much purpose. Light created Destiny. in Las Vegas. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, crafted from so much sadness. Yeah, <laughs> crafted from so much, so much heartbreak and, and sadness. But, it, but Times Square in Vegas. So it is. Uh, I, I, you know, um, I heard uh, strong force. I heard weak force. I heard electromagnetic force. Yeah. What's the fourth one? Weak force. We, but there's four. Yeah. There's four. There's four. Right. Strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravity. Gra- electromagnetic yeah, right, and right, gravity. Right, right. Uh, I I read in maybe ten years ago. I read a book called The God Particle. Oh yeah, by yeah. Leon Letterman. Yeah, it Leon was written Letterman. in the early nineties, yeah. yep, and it's, yep. it was a very difficult. It took a while for me to get through the book because I kept having to reread pages because I didn't. It was trying to process like, wait, I don't have an, any kind of analogous thing to right. connect that to, so I yeah. have to try to imagine. What's happening on a quantum level as he was yeah. going through, and yeah, they were yeah. supposed to build that superconducting super collider. That's right. And then they didn't, but now we have CERN. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, how's CERN? How, like, you know, what, do you think Leon would be happy with the progress? Oh, totally, totally. I, I have a Leon story, too, but before I tell that, so it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that you mentioned this God particle, because what that is about is the Higgs. Right. And so, we're in a very interesting era of physics right now. Because, you know, we have these great experiments that are super successful. Physical theory predicted this idea of the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. Physical theory, you know, uh, predicted what we observed in the cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, uh, inflationary, cold, dark matter physics. And so all these experiments have been really successful at saying we actually do know what we think we know. Right. Right. But. That's kind of a disappointment. Because <laughs> you wanted to learn something else. We wanted to see something, something new. new. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we yeah, already... Yeah. Okay, I guess we kind of thought that yeah. was going to happen. But now, there's something also that's super interesting about the Higgs field. So here's a question I like to ask my students. So if you ask any kid, any, any, any adult, you know, what is matter made of? And well, they'll say... Particles. Atoms, atoms, right? They'll say atoms. Everybody knows that, right? But then you ask them, what makes light? Where does light come from? It's energy, isn't it? Right. See, that's one of the answers you get. Energy, the sun, right? Here's the here's the simplest answer. Matter makes it. Okay? And that's, sure. and that's pretty deep, right? Because the only place it comes from. And the other thing about that is, is that when matter makes light, the signature of what that matter is and what it was doing is encoded in the light. And all the matter that that light interacts with is encoded in the light. And the dynamics of space, if space is contracting or, or expanding, that's encoded in the light. And that's how we use light to study the universe, right? Um, but here's the thing. There is something else that's only made by matter that we'd only observed. And those are fields, right? The fields that you know of, the electromagnetic field, the gravitational field, right? These fields are made by matter. Now, what is the source of this Higgs field? I don't know. Exactly. This field just permeates all of space, but it doesn't have a source that's based in matter, so it's different in that way, right? So that's pretty cool. But now we just have to figure out what that is. Yeah, well, it's, it's something to just think about. Remember going back to our early discussion about space and its yep. nature, right? So it's weird. Now, let me tell you my Leon Letterman story. Okay. All right. So in 1992, I had just completed my first year of graduate school, and I attended this meeting at UC Berkeley. It was, it was like a conference, and it lasted a week, right? And uh, we were putting groups, and... Uh, in the groups, you weren't supposed to identify your position. And I was in a group with Leon Letterman. Was that some sort of a uh, Schrodinger? Uh, uh, it, it, what it was about was... Don't, don't identify it, your position. It, it was called bringing the scientific culture in balance, right? Because we overwork. Certain certain types of people aren't valued. You know, the hierarchy of the system, the, oh, right. the work ethic, how families are considered. You know, like it's a waste of your time to be loving your spouse and children you need to be in the lab right 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 yeah, yeah. right so it's called bringing a scientific culture in balance and so they felt that the way to get the best ideas forward is to have no hierarchy okay right but very quickly people who had you know who were highly accomplished let you know <laughs> what they were <laughs> so, <laughs> so oh it's my nobel prize fall exactly, out of my right. jacket again <laughs> my apologies yeah so so you know we spent a week together and um you know and there was another high ranking person there at the table with us, so i'm not gonna name but anyway leon and i you know leon we got close i felt and uh leon you know he let me know how impressed he was with me as a young graduate student right so Turns out, a year later, you know, I was in grad school at Stanford. He comes to give the scientific colloquium, 
right? And so before the colloquium, we have coffee and donuts. So, you know, everybody's swarming Leon. So right before he goes to talk, I was like, hey, Leon, how you doing, buddy? Remember me? It's Hakeem. He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> we had a week together. I know, man. Remember? We, we bonded. But he's like, nah, dude. I don't remember you. <laughs> you know, the, but the guy like Leon is a celebrity. It's uh, like people, uh, I'm sure, everywhere, yeah. everywhere he goes, people are like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he's, uh, I never actually knew him. My ex-girlfriend's uh, had a friend who knew him, and right, so yeah. he was a very, you know, that that's how I that's how I originally got the book. But uh, I went, I, I was traveling through Illinois once, and I was my friend and I were passing through Batavia, and we we're like, oh my god, I think that's where Fermi Lab is. Yeah. So yeah. we went to we just went to Fermi Lab. Oh, and cool. I, I was working for Wired at the time, so I just oh boy. I, I just went in. I'm like, I write for Wired. Can I come in? And, and they go, sure. Oh. And they gave us a tour, but they were shutting it. They were like. Yeah, all, all these are going to start shutting down. Everything's yeah. moving over to CERN. So. Oh, yeah. What year was that? This was um, – it had to be like 05, oh, maybe? Yeah. O- yeah, oh, 05, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Somewhere in the, in the yeah. mid-aughts. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but it was really – and then seeing seeing the size of Fermilab and them going, yeah, but CERN's going to be crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the superconducting super collider was going to be – Insane. Do you ever think they'll build? Do you ever think they'll build one which basically is just like we just wrapped a wrapped a tunnel around the equator and we're just gonna fire? <laughs> we're just, yeah, we're just gonna be, fire subatomic particles. That would each be other. awesome if we could. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to, uh, <laughs> or just the orbit. Just the orbit, yeah. yeah. I love the... Oh, yeah, yeah. You could just build one. Yeah, the Earth would just look like a space station. No, it's like the Earth on a rail. Oh, that'd be so amazing. But uh, I'd love to talk about your... Uh, because your backstory is really interesting. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, how you became a scientist and, and how you saw that as a path. So just... If you can, talk a little yeah. bit about where, where you were born and what right, your childhood yeah. was like. And- right. Well, you know what, man? I, I tell you, even today, I every moment of my existence, you know, when it's in the, like, I can't believe this is happening mode, you know, I'm just like, dude, I can't believe it. Because in my mind, you know, I'm still the, the kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just, wow. You know, you know, so it's like almost like an out of body experience sometimes. But so my my upbringing, you know, it's not the so here here is how to make an astrophysicist story, <laughs> right? So uh, the first thing is is neither one of my parents graduated high school, right? My dad actually dropped out of school when he was nine years old, all right, right, and unable to read. He left home when he was thirteen. He was born in rural Mississippi, farming kid, right? Goes to New Orleans. You know, joins the army, goes to the Korean War. You know, comes back and takes a factory job. My mother, uh, she was from the city in New Orleans, and she dropped out of school. She was uh, just completed her sophomore year and was pregnant with my older sister. She drops out of school, right? And so uh, they meet. They have me. And when I'm four years old, they divorce, right? And my mom is an awesome woman, but she's really weird. (laughs) (laughs) So. And so we moved every year. Right. And it was always, you know, what people would describe as the ghetto. Right. Right. So, you know, like first grade, I'm in Houston. Second grade, I'm in L.A. Third grade, I'm in New Orleans. Fourth grade, I go to Mississippi for the first time. Fifth grade, New Orleans. Sixth grade, four schools in three states. Seventh grade, Houston. And when I say L.A., you know, I'm talking like, uh, you know, we lived in um, we lived in Watts. You know, Mm -hmm. I went to the first grade in Watts. And then, you know, we lived in Pomona. When I say Houston, you know, South Park, Third Ward. When I say New Orleans, the area that they now call the Goose and the Ninth Ward. Right. And um, my cousins, for example, my first cousins, my mom's siblings, kids, there were three males living here in, in New Orleans, in, in L.A., and uh, they were all members of the Crips gang, right? And so they became adults and started robbing banks. And the two oldest ones, you know, ended up in prison. And, uh, you know, they both got out in the early 2000s. And one, you know, my cousin, you know, you never know today. You hang out with him. You never know he ever spent the day in prison, right? And then uh, the other one, he's back in prison. He started robbing banks again. And uh, my mom saw the handwriting on the wall. And so she decided to move me out of these inner city environments to Mississippi, right? Rural Mississippi, where my dad was from, which is one of the best decisions anyone ever made on my behalf. You know, I was definitely drawn to the dark side, you know, and my dad, you know, was somewhat of a um, visionary entrepreneur. He had businesses that today are legal in certain states, but (laughs) were illegal at the time. And, you know, I participated, you know, I participated. So so he uh, was a botanist. He was a botanist. That's right. That's right. So he had a growing operation in Mississippi (laughs) and an importing operation in New Orleans. (laughs) And uh, when we would be in Mississippi, you know, like, like literally when I was nine years old in Mississippi, you know, 
know it's the country. It's the 70s. The adults would leave. So my family also, my Mississippi, like my cousins, they made bootleg alcohol, right? right? And so, you know, I take you, I can take you to alcohol. I can take you to, to my little country village in Mississippi today and get you some moonshine made by my cousins, oh, right? Wow. Yeah. And um, so anyway, they leave the house and I'm the only one there. And they'd be like, okay. These are here, those are there, those are there, and people would come to the house, like, what you need? Little nine-year-old me would be like, okay, and i do the do the transaction, right? And um, so then I, uh, I uh, my, my academic training in Mississippi, let's say it could have been better. Okay, so, sure. So what happens is uh, several years after I graduate, around 2000, you know, turn of the millennium, Mississippi evaluates all of its, the quality of all of its schools, and every school is giving a rating from one to five. And there were four schools in the state that scored the absolute lowest. Two of them were my middle school and my high school. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But something happened in the 80s. Uh, so a couple of things happened to me that ended up you know, impacting me and making me a scientist. Number one, when we moved every year and we were in these bad neighborhoods, you know, television then wasn't what it is today. right? And I'd stay at home and read a lot. right? And so there were three things types of things to read at my house. My mother had purchased a set of world book encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. There was the Bible mm -hmm. and my mom would do these Dale crossword puzzle books. Right. And, and so I do, she would do the crosswords. And I do like the logic problems and the crisscross and all the right. other things. Right. And, um, I literally read those world book encyclopedias from A to Z by the age of 10. Oh, wow. And I discovered Albert Einstein and special relativity. And I became incredibly interested because I was interested in the weird stuff, right? Like I discovered that, you know, uh, minors couldn't be held into a contract, right? So Time Life books, remember they, they like, you know, the strange <laughs> sharks. So I was ordering these books, right? <laughs> and relativity was like the weirdest thing ever because I kind of knew ghosts and all that was make-believe. But, you know, Einstein's relativity is real. You know, and that just really captured my imagination. And then when I moved to Mississippi is when personal computers came out, right? And so my girlfriend at the time, like my freshman year girlfriend, her family bought her one of these little computers, but she just let it sit there. And it had a little book that taught you a, a bit about the basic programming language. So I taught myself the basic programming language. And then, you know, I do outreach today, but what happened is there was a university nearby, the University of Southern Mississippi, and the, the professors came there to do outreach, and they told us. So I'm at this all-black school in Mississippi, right, that, that has, you know, not the best uh, educational system, and these guys come and say, hey, there is this thing that exists that's called um, uh, science fairs, and we would like for you to participate. Now, my school had been given a gift of PCs that just sat there. And my and I was the only one. I was always in there working on them. I was the only one who knew how to use uh, a computer, how to program. Right, everything was DOS at the time. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. There was no Windows, and so this, the you know everybody was so supportive of me that they actually let me take a computer home. Holy shit! Yeah, and so when these guys came and said you guys should participate in the science fair, I was like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll program up all the effects of special relativity. Now, <laughs> how old are you at this point? So I'm like a um. So this is like 15, 16. Sure. Yeah, and so I didn't know how high a level of what I was doing was, right? I had no idea. What I was doing was modeling special relativity. Boy, it's, it's interesting because it's almost like had you had a very structured educational environment, you might have gone, well, that's way too advanced. I, yeah, can't, yeah. I can't do that. But right. you didn't actually know that it was too advanced. Exactly. So you just did it. Yeah, I just did it. So I'm this kid who's always by himself, you know, in the room doing stuff, right? Reading about relativity, working on a little computer program. Because when you're in the country, it's boring. Right. You know what I mean? And so I'm just spending all my time by myself and my mind, right, doing these things. And so I can imagine, like, like when I became an adult, I was like, oh, my God, what must those science fair judges have, have thought to find this little kid, you know, from this town? And, you know, that I'm here talking to these guys about relativity. And, I, and, and, hey, man, I knew it inside and out, you know, at, at this point, because I had literally been studying it for years. And even though my mathematics was horrible, I taught myself the mathematics of special relativity in order to do this. That's crazy. And, then, yeah. and obviously, at that time, there was not an internet 
So no. you you really did have – so where are you finding all this information? So really, relativity was just in the encyclopedia. And so just the equations of time dilation, length contraction, the, the momentum effect, and uh, what they call the space-time interval, or, or as I called it then, the invariant intervals, mm-hmm. right? So I just, I just found those simple equations, mm-hmm. and I – I hadn't learned algebra. In fact, man, you know, another like accident of my life is that I went to the Navy after high school. I didn't go to college. Right. So that's another weird story. So I was a valedictorian of my high school. I had I would hope so. Yeah. I had scored the highest score ever on the ACT test. My lowest score was math, by the way. Right. I always (laughs) bombed math. Yeah. I I had bad mathematics. Right. And, um, you know, I was an all-state musician. And um, but yet one day my my um, principal called me into his office. Now, I knew him more than the normal student-principal re- re- uh, relationship because I was friends with his daughter and his son, right? Mm-hmm. So I would go to their house. So what he did, he thought he was doing in my best interest, right? So he calls me to the office one day, and he says, so we had all, the entire school had taken the armed services vocational aptitude battery test, okay. right, the military test. So he calls me into his office, and he says, what are you going to do after high school? And I said, well, I'm going to go to college. And he looks at me. You know, with the, like a like poor, naive kid. Right. Right. And he's like, well, how are you going to pay for it? And I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm good academically and I'm a good musician, so I'll probably get a scholarship. And he gives me that poor, naive kid look again. And he's like, let me introduce you to somebody. And he takes me to his inner office. And then there's a Navy recruiter, Senior Chief Gage. And Senior Chief Gage, the very first words he says to me is, look, the most I can offer you is twenty thousand dollars a year now. In Mississippi in 1983, for my community, $20,000 a year sounded huge. like, yeah, it's like a quarter million today, right? Right. Which is, right, right. And so I'm thinking, what? And he's like, and if you go nuke, which I know you will, right? Because I had done really well in the exam. If you re-enlist after two years, we give you a $30,000 a year, sign. we give you, excuse me, a $30,000 signing bonus. And he's like, but we don't give it to you all at once. We give you a check for 15000 and then give you the rest in installments. That's it. Right. I'm I'm in. Right. One hundred percent. So I go to the Navy first. Right. And in the Navy, I got accepted into this officer training program called Boost, where it takes enlisted people and from from places with poor education, people from like Appalachia and other states with poor educational systems. And they take you through intense military training, but they also take you through intense academic training. Mm-hmm. And they take you from arithmetic through calculus. In a single year. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was amazing. I had the most amazing. And so, you know, I was just reunited with one of those guys. He was my squad leader today. So I was in the lower. There was two math class. I was in the lower level class, right? He was in the upper level class. And I had this amazing teacher named Mr. Galuli. And it was there that I learned algebra. And that's what say, that's what allowed me to survive in college. But even still, when I went to college, I dropped out. Because I thought I wasn't smart enough. I was doing horribly, especially in my math classes. This must have been really screwing with your mind, considering you're like, but I was so good at relativity. Well, no, I didn't, I didn't see it that way, right? Because I, you know, when you grow up in a certain environment, you know, you see, you, you, you don't think, you know, identity is, um, you know, it, it's not like, you know, how, how there's a look and feel to authority and, and, and um, you know, and intelligence and all this sort of thing, right? So, you know, we're all taught, you know, you see an Asian kid, you know, oh, expect they're going to be good at mathematics. Right. You see a kid from my neighborhood, oh, poor kid, right? Right. And, and you think of yourself that way, you know, identity is that way. So I didn't, I never thought for a second. And not only that, you know, at my college, Everybody wasn't from the poor, you know, deep woods, dirt road location, right? Some people were from the, some people were from Jackson and Natchez. And, you, you know, these kids were fancier. Right. You know, they had nice cars. So I'm coming in there, you know, and, and looking at myself. And I'm like, dude, you know, do I belong here? You know, and not only, man, I'll tell you a funny story. I'm in my first week of classes. It's a math class. Professor goes to the board and starts lecturing, right? I'd never seen a lecture. And all the students are sitting there taking notes. <laughs> and I'm looking around the loop room like, what is everybody writing? And how do they all know what to write? And I don't. You know, I'm like, what's going on in here? You know? And it was explained to me. So eventually, after a couple of years, I figure, you know, I'm not smart enough and I drop out. And I'm working as a janitor at a nearby hotel. And the bellhop gets fired. And I apply for the bellhop position. And I don't get it. I'm not bellhop material, right? I'm more janitor material, right? And I thought to myself, I can't move up from janitor to bellhop. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going back to college. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I did. And not only that, I decided at that time, well, look, 
I have to crack this mathematical puzzle. So I decided I'm going to do every problem in the calculus book. And literally every night, me and this girl would go to the back to, you know, after dinner, we'd go back to the uh, academic building on the whiteboard. And we literally did every problem in the calculus book. And I never got a grade less than A in my math classes after that. So it was just really taking the time to apply and getting the, getting the stuff into your head. Well, it was an intense application. It wasn't the standard. It was beyond what. It, you know, it was beyond what, you know, if you read a book on how to study and, you know, how to do it properly, it was a lot more intense than that, right? Doing that would not have gotten me there, right? I had to, you know, just, it's like Michael Jordan, right? Like not making his high school basketball team, right? You got to go and shoot like a thousand free throws a day, right? You, right. You're not going to do a shooting 50 or 100 right. or 200, right? Right. Yeah. You know, you got to go way over and beyond. Well, it just, so the idea of, because, you know, there's, a, I think there's a certain amount of, uh, hey, if you're smarter, if you're into nerdy stuff now, that's pretty cool. But in the 80s, it was not a cool thing to do at all. And in fact, I feel like people were socially ostracized quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So particularly at a school in rural Mississippi, yeah. how much did how much did that factor in like society, like society pressure from other students or, or, or – cultural expectations like how yeah. much does all that figure in and how are you how are you getting around the roadblocks yeah so that didn't factor in at all so so you know i hear that a lot and i don't know the degree to which that exists in different people's lives for example have you ever watched um amateur night at the apollo sure yeah so you ever notice when they bring the kids out and kiki shepherd introduces a kid and they ask the kid she always asks the kid what's your favorite subject in school and if the kid said anything related to math or science the audience will go wild. Yeah. Right? Because the 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 our community, you know, was so supportive of that because it recognized the importance of it and how lacking it is in our community. Right? And so it was the opposite. And so what happened with me was was that even though I was that kind of academic guy, my social behavior wasn't that at all. Right? I was the gangster gangster guy, right? I was thugging it up. And so my academic friends were like, why are you hanging out with those people? What's wrong with you? You know? And they thought they had it all. Like I took I brought my daddy's business with me to college. You know what I mean? Uh. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll tell you this. I didn't intend to. It wasn't my I didn't think of it myself. What happened is is that you know, I say to my uh, my friend one day, I'm like, hey, you want to go down to New Orleans with me? My dad, you know, and he's like, what? You're like, yeah. I was like, my dad, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, really? He's like, man, then why don't we? I was like, why? You know, he's like, man, come on, let's do it. And so next thing you know, we're making these runs back and forth. Yeah, and That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, man. I mean, it got even, it got way darker and more so what, hectic than that. So there, there must have been, you must have hit crossroads along the oh, way definitely. that said, well, you can either go down this path oh, yeah, or you can go down this path. Yeah, so what yeah. what kept you on the path that yeah. led you to where you are? Well, you know, so I knew I needed to eat and live indoors, mm -hmm. right? And so at every stage of, okay, I see this ending. I have to do something to continue eating next time, right? So as high school is ending, okay, I need to set something up, right? And and going through these institutions works really well. So if I'm going from high school to the military, right, I know I have a place to lay my head and a place to eat. Right. When I got home, you know, I was kind of aimless. My friends encouraged me to go to college. And the thing that, you know, won me over is when they told me the male to female ratio at Tougaloo College. You know, that's when I <laughs> was like, OK, I'm in. Right. And then, uh, you know, college is coming to an end. I have to, you know, either I'm I'm going to I'm going to be stuck at janitor or I have to, uh, you know, do something excuse me, to make it happen. You know, so what was it? Was it uh, what was instilled in you? Like, what was your influence? Like, what made you push through boundaries? What made you, um, you know, pursue things yeah. that weren't readily available to everyone else, but right, made you right. think, well, there's no reason I can't do this? Yeah, so, well, see, that's the thing, is that I didn't know I wasn't supposed to not know to do that. But right? not everyone does like, that, though. Yeah, so it was, first off, it was, I was just interested in it, right? I just happened to be interested in it. So there was no influence. There was no external influence. Like, you hear people talk about, oh, yeah, I got my first telescope and all that. Yeah, there was nobody. Nobody in my environment said anything to me about this stuff, right? It was it was just 100%, oh, I'm reading, this catches my you know attention, and I'm going to feed on that stuff to the degree that I can. Now, my mom was incredibly supportive. So what she would do, you know, I was kind of a latchkey kid, and she worked shifts. So sometimes, you know, she worked 3 to 11 or 11 to 7, and um, what would happen is sometimes I'd come home, and she'd have these, she'd gone to the library and gotten books on Einstein. They'd be on the kitchen table, right? But that was the extent of it, right? Or like the school letting me borrow the computer but as far as like the direction 
You know, and in fact, I remember when I went, because I won the state science fair in physics, right, in 1985, and they asked me, they said, like, yeah, who, who taught you this? You know, how'd you learn this? I was like, nobody. You know, I just, <laughs> I just did it, right? Um, and so uh, when I got to the university, um, again, it was one of these things where, you know, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing how, you know, an individual can impact you, right? There are people that will express doubt in you and that will send people off on another path. So let's talk, let me ask, answer your question directly. Number one is in Mississippi, I learned work ethic, right? I learned like they worked you physically. Like, I don't know if you ever heard of like hauling pulp wood, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you would get, you would work far beyond what you thought your level was in physical labor. Mm -hmm. And you learn, I learned how to push myself, right? I learned how to just, you know, like, you know, you learned will, you know, and so the other thing was competitiveness, right? When somebody doubted me, every time somebody told me, to, you know, I couldn't, like, you're not bellhop material. When I dropped out of college, you had to go and talk to, um, I forget what the position was, but I went and talked to her and she told me I was doing the right thing to drop out, right? You know, this is a school official, right? I dropped, me, my roommate, and this other guy dropped out. And they told the two of them, they were farther along in their education. Oh, you know, stay, you only have a year. And they told me, no, nope, you're doing the right thing, drop out. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And even when I was at Stanford, I was encouraged to drop out. You know, that's a whole other story. Um, and, uh, you know, and so every time somebody told me something like that, I thought, oh, I'll show you. You know, so my defiance and my competitiveness, you know, and my work ethic is what uh, took me through. But, but those are, I think those are valuable teaching tools is teaching people how to use competitiveness and teaching people how to accomplish through defiance, I think, is, yeah. is a really interesting tactic because I think uh – you know, it, it, not everyone has an interest in special relativity, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. and so I think people aren't – maybe the thing that would ultimately be very interesting to them isn't just – isn't kind of just accidentally there. Right. So, right. you yeah, know, right. how can you use that to – how could you use that to inspire people or to teach people like, you know, if you're not getting what you want, how, how to seek out the things that you might be really interested in so that you don't settle for, you know, a life yeah. that might be less than what you. That's right. And what you're capable of. Right. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I see that. I mean, it kills me when I look around the world and I see like certain communities that everybody is going into, you know, menial labor type positions because they don't see any any different. Right. And it and, and, and it. And so. Um, so I've I've man have been literally traveling the world going to co communities that I identify with to talk to these kids and uh, let them see me, you know? And so had I become like, I'm so intelligent, I talk funny guy, I wouldn't reach them. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't reach them. Like, I literally have gone into schools and had rap battles with kids, you know, in, in South Africa and, and you know, and, and um, you know, and, and, and what's amazing, one of the most amazing aspects of my career, the number of kids that have emailed me, you know, and a lot of them are African students say, listen, I'm going, I'm going to college now. And the only reason, remember you came and visited my school and they say, the only reason I'm going is because of you and what you said to me. Right. Um, and because they, you know, it has to come, the message has to come from certain sources to be believable. Sure. And so what I get over and over is, is people telling me, man, I thought I was dumb until I met you. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting because they're in a. But, but you see that it can be taken two ways. Right? <laughs> Understand that. <laughs> there is a compliment in there, and then there's also like, a, wait a minute. Yeah. But uh, but but I think um, you know being able to represent science from a lot of different perspectives is really is really important because yeah. I think so many more people have the capacity for it. But it, but in a. In you know, if they're in an institution or a, or a, a situation where the school just doesn't do the effort or know how to yeah, reach them, right. they're never going to reach that yeah. potential. Oh, but listen, we, we always refer to the schools, but understand this. When I went to graduate school, right, so this is Stanford University, physics at Stanford. That's, you know, these are top people, right? My research group consisted of seven people. Four of them, their fathers had PhDs in physics. And I'm not talking about off in a little school somewhere. I'm talking about one is at CERN, one is a professor at UC San Diego, one's a professor somewhere else. And, you know, th you know, that was my that's the competition. Yeah. Right. Um, so what happens at home is where these differences are made. You know, w you know, by the time be the d before you step a, a foot in school for a single day, there's always there's already a huge gap. Based on the kid whose dad dropped out of school when he was nine, and dad and the kid whose right. father, and, you know, and so you go down and and uh, you know sit down and take a test. It's not equal, 
right? You're not, it's not equal. It, you, you know, this, this, you know, this guy cheated. His dad has a PhD in physics. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not the same. Right. And also, I would also imagine that the, the, the way the tests are presented sometimes probably because, you know. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah language is, 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 you know, something I noticed. Now, this might, this might sound bad, but <laughs> have you ever noticed how the slang of like the cool communities, everybody adopts it? Yeah, but the slang of the squares, nobody picks that up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So the language of science is kind of the slang of the squares. Right. It right. is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you know, it, it just doesn't feel right. You know, and you, and it's a, you know, and even the, the thinking of science, the logical thinking of it, is, is not intuitive at all. You know, and it's it's something you have to train your brain. In, in these particular ways. Well, I think it's yeah. t- it's teaching people to rebel against the right things because, um, you know, I, I, and I, I think this transcends all. I mean, this is I think this is something that unites all cultures is that, you know, young people will have a, a, a sort of a need to rebel against whatever the stru- right. in, in, whatever yeah, the yeah. structure is and whatever yeah. the, you know, so. When young people, like when they think about science, they think, oh, well, that's structured, that's companies, that's corporate, that's, that's right. not exactly. cool, yeah, it's yeah. not breaking any rules, it's yeah, all rules. Yeah, right. But, you know, if you're teaching, if you teach someone to rebel against, you know, like for yeah, in your case, yeah. finding answers for things that they didn't think they should be able to find out. I mean, like that's a different way to – to get someone to understand yeah, yeah, something rather than yeah, sit down, read yeah, this, yeah. and shut up about it. Exactly, right? And, and let me tell you, you know, to, to make matters worse, you know – so I have this uh, certain educational products that are, become, that are going to be rolled out soon. But, you know, the way we teach mathematics, for example, is just horrible. You know, for, from the very beginning, we're misled. The very first thing we're taught is that math is about numbers. It's not. And so I'm not going to go any more deeper in that because I don't want your audience to fall asleep. They won't but, fall asleep. Just yeah. g- give us a, a little more headline. What, if math is not numbers. What is math it? Not, so so the, the key, what math is, math is a systematic method of rigorous lo- logic, right? And it's symbolic. And so uh, symbolic thinking is what you need. And, and that shows up, I like to call it just algebraic thinking. And the first time you introduce kids to algebraic thought, first off, it should happen before they even step a foot in school. But it happens. When it does happen, it's done completely wrong. They're, okay, here's your first example of algebraic thought. X plus three equals seven. What is X? Mm-hmm. Right? So the first thing you think, oh, X is a number. Right. Right? But when you do, when you get a problem, when you see something that looks like X plus three equals seven in the real world, you've already gone through 80,000 steps and that's the la- that problem is now solved. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. And that's when numbers show up. Right? But that entire 80,000 steps of logic you're not really even – you're not sticking any numbers in there for the most part. Right. right? Yeah. So I don't want to give away my, my thing. Sure. Right? But of yeah, course. Yeah. But I'll tell you something else. Remember that whole thing I told you about um, I thought I was dumb until I met you? You know, one of the most amazing opportunities I've had now – is, you know, so I've been going, showing up places, right? And you can only reach so many people in a day doing that, right? But then my friends at Science Channel decided to put me on television. And so now, man, as I walk through the world, literally, I get recognized all the time. And all these people come up to me. And I'm talking about from all walks of life, but they identify with me and my story. You know, like, <clears throat> for example, one day, I'm in Florida. I'm hanging out in a bar uh, with this guy I know who's a radio DJ, right? We're eating pizza. And this old man comes up to me. This guy has to be in his 70s. <clears throat> Cowboy hat, boots, buckle, you know, older white guy, you know, in the South, right? And he comes How up to me. How could that go wrong? Right? No, no. He comes up to me. He's like, are you Hakeem? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. He's like, man, I am your biggest fan. Oh, that's right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this sort of thing happens to me all the time. But all these people say this, you know, I hear this thing over and over. Man, you know, I get it. I get it when you say it. And I realize that I can do it. Right. And I see guys that you can tell they're in their 30s, their family, people, they watch the show with their kids and they tell me I'm going back to school. Right. You know, basically, I thought I was dumb, dude. Then I saw you on TV. And if you can do it, (laughs) I can do it. So it really is, you know, ultimately, it really is all about language. And not just word language, but just like, and not even cultural language, but like community language. Like every every tiny community has its own shorthand and its own language. Oh, it does. 
Math is a language. Yeah. Like getting, yeah. And, it, and it's all just figuring out. Like, you couldn't just put a bunch of, like, kanji characters down in front of someone and go, okay, <laughs> yeah. let's go. Like, yeah. you would have to have some cultural understanding. You'd have to right. really, you know. I didn't really understand English well until I studied Latin for four years. Mm. To understand the base of, like, uh, the base of what a lot of our, yeah. I mean, even though English is not a romance language, but it, it it's still a lot of our basis in Latin, in language structure. So even understanding the structure is like, oh, this is why we have this. And that made that made my own language that much more interesting to me, right. my yeah. own yeah. native tongue. But I, but I think this idea of language and, you know, and more voices that know how to communicate languages in a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. I mean, a science and a lot, from a lot of different yeah. perspectives. Have you ever considered... Do you ever play around with Facebook Live at all? No, I, I don't. You know, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things that happen live online and all this kind of stuff. And and so, you know, I'm, I'm believe it or not, I'm a really reclusive, like stick to myself and think kind of a guy. And so I don't participate in a lot. You know, like if I get invited somewhere to do something, I do it. Right. I can stand in front of a crowd of thousands and be perfectly comfortable. Right. right? But then once everything uh, goes away. You know, I, I pretty much am like one on one or by myself. You know, I, 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 I would. What I would pitch to you is maybe uh, once a month or once every so often. You know, you you go on a I, maybe you have a Facebook page or if you don't, yeah, you, I do. You start, yeah. Okay, so you start your Facebook page. What's what is your Facebook? I guess people. Just... Hakeem Olushei. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Twitter too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, and that's H A K E E M. Yes. O L U S E Y I. So. Yeah. If you go on this Facebook page every so often, you do a Facebook live chat, it's essentially like this is your opportunity to reach people. So you could say to people, listen, if you have any questions about science or how to pursue yeah, science, yeah, if yeah. you feel alone yeah. or if you're ashamed of right. your you know, the, of your intelligence, because I yeah. feel like there is sometimes there is communal shaming versus yeah, like, hey, yeah. you're not so smart. Fuck you. You know, right, right, like right. maybe there is an opportunity for you to reach out to these people and have like the equivalent yeah. of office hours. Oh, Let yeah, people yeah. come on, yeah. you know, and ask questions in real time. Yeah. And I think you, I think you'd be able to impact a lot of people at once. That's a, you, that's a good you, idea. If you did it regularly, right. it would build. Yeah, you know what's good about your idea is because people are constantly contacting me from around the world with exactly those questions. And so instead of doing it one at a time, <laughs> you know, yeah, if you just, if you yeah. just had like a, an appointment every so often, yeah, like you right. know, the first Sunday of every month yeah. at noon. I'm going to do this Facebook live chat. You're going right. to show up. You're going to ask your questions. You can ask me anything. So is it – do I have to type or do I get to just talk? No, no. You oh, just talk. <laughs> it's video. You, it's video. Uh, it's a video. It's, a, li see. it's a live yeah, stream. Yeah. And then you see – Below you, you know, the comments come really fast, but you can control oh, the speed of the comments, and you can uh. just kind of answer one at a time. And yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you, you literally could talk to a hundred thousand people at once. Wow! And uh, I mean, you could talk to an infinite number of people at once. But that doesn't I mean, exist. But no, that's that true. Does. You, <laughs> you could talk to theoretically <laughs> two billion people <laughs> at once if everyone on Facebook yeah. got on at the same time. Yeah. And they would. But you know, you, you could affect a large number of people right. who would then go and disseminate that information right. and, yeah. and change lives. That way, and I just think it would be a fun. Also, as someone who is promoting science, right. and, and yeah. you have your own stuff to promote yeah. and everything, yeah. I, I just think it would. I think it would help get your message out yeah. there more because I do believe that science needs more diverse points of view as, yeah. as just different forms of language to communicate these yeah. these concepts. Well, thanks for informing me because I didn't even know Facebook Live existed. Now, it's, I, now it, I do. The, yeah. the, you know, it's a thing they've had for a little while, but they've only just started promoting it as I a see. thing. Right. And so they're putting a lot of resources behind yeah. it. And, you know, I'll do them. I'll do them for non uh, – things that aren't really that important like you know entertainment shows like right. oh like, yeah. we just watch walking dead now i'll do a and you know fifty thousand people will wow. come on at once and we'll just have that a conversation amazing. so you yeah. you could affect a lot of change that way yeah. and i think you really i think it would be really helpful and yeah. you know social media is a language another of language course. that people understand that's right, that's right. and you know what I, I tell you there's something troubling to me about some of the um Science communication now, and 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 it seems like you know there's it, it, it is, there's sort of an elitism associated with it. You know, it's sort of like you know I have the knowledge that you need to know, and you know it's sort of like um, we're you know like what it, the example is B O B. Right. The flat earth. Right. Thing. Yeah. You know, nobody believes the earth is flat. Right. <laughs> Why even address that? You know, but Why it became it any... this big thing among the science writers about like, you know, and so all these, you know, I first thought I first thought of this when I was reading the astronomy textbooks. Every astronomy textbook at the university level would have this section in the beginning where they talk about where they address astrology. 
and how, you know, somehow astrology is making people not understand or believe, you know, what we observe to be true about the universe and astronomy. And I'm like, that doesn't exist. That's not a problem. <laughs> you know, there, 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 is, there are phenomena that are like that, but you're scared to take that on, right? You're scared to address that, those phenomena. So, you're, you know, you're creating these things that don't really exist. And so what ends up happening, instead of being an inclusive thing, it brings together the people who already are like, you know, they, they already have that identity, right? right? They're already like, yeah, we're the smart ones and we know, but you idiots over there, you don't know, right? right? Yeah, and, and, you know, that's, that's a bit troubling. Well, there, there is a little bit of politics in, in knowledge. In politics, I, I don't mean like traditional government politics, but I mean in terms of like balance of power, like information can be used to alienate people, information can be used as a weapon happen or it can be used to you know keep people at a distance i mean yeah. it has throughout history you know oh, yeah and yeah, so yeah. it's kind of breaking down these walls and figuring out ways to to communicate with people better and and also it must be interesting do you ever I, i'm sure you've had students in your class where they didn't turn in something on time or they didn't they're not reaching their full potential and then they're yeah. like well, my life is really hard, and I didn't yeah. have all the breaks. And you're like, right. <laughs> let me just tell you a little story about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like is that yeah, is that yeah, frustrating to you yeah. when people make excuses when you, you know, you had to work so hard? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, man. To be honest, I'm a big softy. I'm really forgiving and understanding, right? Right. And uh, so you know, and I really try to encourage and include and bring people along. But at the same time, there is like so if they complain about a hard life. You know, I give a sympathetic ear, ear to that. But if you're complaining about how hard the work is, oh, you get no sympathy for me. <laughs> yeah, and let me tell you, working for me is like one of my research students can be a nightmare because a couple of my philosophies are eating and sleeping. They're not priorities. <laughs> you get this work done. You can eat and sleep five days from now, right? I'm serious. Like, dude, you know, if there's something to be done, you do what you got to do to get it done, yeah. right? And, and you know, like, because when I was in the military, they used to tell us that all the time. You sleep forever when you're dead. You right. know, get it done, you know? And, 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 and I bring that along. But, you know, if you're like, I broke my leg, okay, I got sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, the, you know, the more I talk to people and the more I've researched about success and the more I've studied it and... The, there really is no – I mean everyone kind of has a slightly different path, but there's no great secret in that the people that are the most successful tend to put the most time into things. Clearly. And that's, Clearly. that's it. That's it. It's that's consistency, it. yep. kind of figuring yep. out what yep. works, not being afraid to fail, yep. learning from your mistakes and yep. moving on. Yeah, exactly. I, I, exactly. And now, you know, also not uh, <laughs> not multitasking. Right. That's, there's nothing like a single-minded focus. And just stick to it and just put it in the time. It's so hard because there's so much pressure now to multitask because there's so many things to do yeah. and process. And yeah. and as a scientist, you know, I, I uh, you know, so there is a phrase, right? If you want to get something done, ask somebody who's busy, <laughs> right? And so I found myself in a in a uh, in a point where you know I'm on all these different committees, you know, national committees, university committees. I'm you know I'm doing things, uh, you know, my outreach stuff. I'm doing my science stuff. I have my education stuff. And it, it just all was just this giant thing I was holding up. And so a few years ago, I just started, like, resigning from things. Nope, can't do it. Sorry. Nope, I'm out of here. Be, bye, you know, so I can get back. Because I ended up being a science manager mm -hmm. rather than, um, you know, the guy doing the work. And I really love being the guy doing the work, right, And uh, amongst other people doing the work. Right. Uh, and. Um, you know, and, and what happens, you know, if you're at one of the top universities where you have the top students in the world, you know, you give the students an idea and not only do they do it, they actually like add to it. But if you're at a smaller university, the students require a lot more of your attention as a professor. And you actually do have to get in there and get your hands dirty and do a lot of work. Right. So being just a manager wasn't really allowing me to be as competitive in terms of the um putting out a lot of high quality work, right? right. As, as I had been in my earlier career. So that's why I just unloaded everything, right? So that I can now once again, focus. Well, that's smart. And that's also, um, that's also another lesson of, of, of learning how to, because I think in the beginning, you do kind of try everything, you do everything, because you right. want to, you want to get as much in your brain as possible. And you want to, you know, you, you just want to kind of experience a lot of different things. But at a certain point, you do have to become responsible enough to go uh, that. Yeah. And, and I think that just comes from the clearer your goals become, yeah, yeah. which is very important in figuring that's, that's out what, right. what your goals are, then you can figure out what you can say no to. Nah, I don't really right. need to do that. It's more important that I just focus on this. Yeah. And, and, you, that, know, and, and you know, the, the, um, the, uh, 
I, I, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm a professor, so that's what we do. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> I mean, do you uh, – what, what, what are you working on? What, what is there something right now? What really excites you about yeah. science? Oh, I, that, that remi- you, you brought me right back to what I was thinking. Great. So what really excites me – is these deep questions that I was that I brought up very early in the discussion and getting the answers to those deep questions is very difficult in today's working environment because you know just like if you work when I, I worked in Silicon Valley right out of graduate school and you know it was what have you done for me last quarter right right and so if if you're in the university position you know it's like okay what papers did you publish this last year and how many grants did you apply for this last year and how many grants did you bring in this last year and if you're going to do what albert einstein did where you're going to take take you know years to think about a problem to get to the answer it doesn't work in today's environment Right. Because if I don't bring in the grants, I don't pay my summer salary. Right. And not only that, my university is going to say, oh, well, you're not a researcher. So we're going to give you four classes a semester when really, if you're going to be a researcher, you can only teach one class and still be productive as a researcher. Right. You know, and um, so the system is. And so that's another benefit of having my educational and media um, endeavors is that now I can sort of buy myself out from that treadmill and focus on these deep questions that I might not get, if I get to an answer, it's not going to happen for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Right. Right. Yeah. But, but it takes that kind of focus on those types of, over those types of time periods to do that. And, and, and it's something that's not available to the vast majority of our researchers. It's only the few people in the, in, you know, in these very resourced locations. No, so though it's almost like being a, a, a prisoner of the structure of it. It's like yeah. you need to do it to keep going, but in order to keep it going, you have to pay for it. So you have to make, you know, you have to make allowances that take yeah. you away from the thing that you want to do. So I think it it really yeah. sounds like you have to maintain as much focus on on what you're trying to do as possible yeah. and not yeah. not lose lose that focus. Yeah, and, and and you know what? So I, I would always tell my students this. So I'll give them advice, right? You're going to be a physicist when you got to the junior senior level. So you you're here junior senior level hardcore physics classes. Clearly, you're thinking about becoming a physicist. So let me give you some advice. And this isn't advice, but let me just tell you how I am and how my colleagues are. From this point forward, at any point in your life, just stop and think and say to yourself, hey, I bet Hakeem is thinking physics right now. And you know what? (laughs) It will be true. Right? Yeah, because... I heard this from a physicist, Rocky Cobb, several years ago, about 13 years ago. It's not his quote. He quoted someone else. But it it goes something like this. It's not what you don't know. It's what you know that ain't so, right, that allows you to to really be insightful in physics. And so that's what I set my mind to thinking about. What is it that we know that really we don't actually know? Because I, whenever I'm asked by students or anyone, you know, what was my most valuable thing I learned in my physics training? It was when I learned the difference between when I know something and I don't know it. What does it actually mean to know something, right? And, you know, this, this even goes to the everyday life, like politicians. So I look on the news, and as I say apologize, I meant politics, right? right? I look on the news, and they'll have these polls. Well, yeah, 85% of people believe this. I'm like, well, who cares what people believe? Or they'll ask a politician, do you believe such and such? Who cares what you believe, right? My knowledge of belief is you accept it as being true without actually observing it to be true. Right. right? So that, that's, I call that speculation, <laughs> right? Conjecture. What do you, 85% yeah. speculate. Exactly, right? <laughs> but what do we know? What, has we, what have we observed to be true, right? And so... There are a lot of things that we accept as true that we haven't actually observed to be true, right? And so, for example, with with Einstein, it was, um, you know, the fact that time is this linear thing that's the same everywhere, right? And then once once you broke that paradigm, you you realize, wow, you know, it, it, it depends on the frame of reference or the idea that, you know, Aristotle uh, or whoever the Greek philosophers presented that, you know, heavier things fall faster, Right. Well, has anyone actually observed that to be true? They did these logical, you know, philosophical, speculative philosophy questions. But let me go and drop two things and (laughs) and see. So there is there are things about, you know, space and time is is this frontier and fields that, you know, we kind of accept is true, but may not be. Right. And so those are the things I'm thinking about that I'm trying to crack. What is your first uh, what's when you when you start a class? It's day one. Yeah. What's the first thing you say to your students when you introduce yourself? 
you know, I haven't taught a class in a few years, so I don't really remember. But I tell you this, here's here's a really weird thing. Right. So I I give a lot of talks, but believe it or not, I've always had this fear on the first day of class and it's never gone away. So when you step in front of the class, you know, the the, the students are all there like, you know, there's this murmur in the class. And when you step in the front of the class as a professor, they're supposed to be quiet and pay attention. Right. And 100 percent of the time, they always have. But I've always wondered, what if one day they don't? And they like start throwing tomatoes and eggs, you know. Because <laughs> it's a vaudeville. They're in vaudeville and they brought a bucket of rotten fruit to, to throw it. To... Yeah, but basically, you know, you have your syllabus. And so it's not anything deep, you know, right out the back. You know, you just go over the syllabus. And at the end is where I start giving them their advice on how to be a physicist and how to be successful. And I try to tell them the things that they're not going to hear everywhere else. Because there are the standard things. If you want to go to college, if you want to go to grad school, there's the standard things. And so... Um, there's this conference I attend for students and, uh, I would give this, there was, there was this, um, session I would give with this professor from, um, Texas, Juan Brochiaga, right? Love this guy. Right. And so he give the standard, okay, you got to take these classes. You got to get these grades. You got to get this score on the exams. You got this, right. And then I go up and get my, my talk and I'm like, okay, now let's suppose you don't do any of that, <laughs> but you know, you're smart, right? You're like me, right? Like my overall undergraduate grade point average was 2.88. Right. That's not high at all. Right. And these top schools will tell you if you don't have at least a three, four, don't even apply. Right. Now, my physics and math scores were incredibly high. But any other class, I didn't attend it. Right. And I was getting D's and C's. You know, I'm just like, forget that. I'm not interested in that. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, in, in physics, that works. Right. This, oh, this kid knows what he wants to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so there are these people out here that don't look the part. They don't look the role. But anyway, what are the superpowers? Let me tell you one superpower in learning, right? And in creativity, speaking. You can, I, I, I'll be working on something and I'm stuck. This, is, this was back when I was a student and now as I'm working on research problems. I'll be completely stuck and I'm going over it over and over again. I'm paper, I'm on the whiteboard. I'm going over it over and over. And, I, and, I, and you know, I'm stuck for like a week or two. I'll go next door to my faculty colleague and I'll say, hey, Eric, let me tell you what I'm working on. And I explain the problem to him and then I figure it out. It, it comes to me and he never says a word, <laughs> literally. And I walk out and I'm like, thank you. And it's like that all the time. Even with this show, Outrageous Acts of Science, right? I will, you know, they, they, they find the clips, the, the production company, and they, they have their uh, team of, you know, they have retired scientists, graduate students that look at it and give their take, you know, and I'll look over it and, and, you know, they send it to me ahead of time. I'll look over it and see if I agree with it. And I'm like, okay, some of them, you know, I'll say, ah, you know, maybe tweak this, that or the other. But most of the time it seems perfectly okay. And then we get on the set and I speak it out loud. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not what's happening. Right. And then, you know, we nail it. Right. Every time. Right. So thinking physics all the time, speaking, speaking it, um, that whole thing I told you about doing every problem in the book, just like you say it, putting in the time when it comes to mathematics, when it comes to physics, even in lab work, there's no substitute for just putting in the time, putting in the work and just doing it over and over and over and over again. I don't care who you are. Right. You will. You will get it. Right. And then there is that insidious thing that I call identity and You know, based on who you are, based on where you're from, based on what your community is, you may think, you know, this is me or this is not me. And that it it just isn't true. And I see these people from certain communities that identify with, oh, yeah, we're good at math. We're the good one. These guys will be dumb as dirt. And the next thing you know, they got a Ph.D. in engineering. They're working and they're still dumb as dirt. (laughs) Right. And then you have these other guys over here who are brilliant, who didn't step a foot in a college because of their identity. You know, and where they're from. And so we, we got to kill that thing, right? That, that is not it. You know, or, you know, women who think I can be a nurse, but I'm not even going to consider being a doctor. You know, that, you know. So how do we break through a lot of that stuff? Is it at the level of getting people to not accept um, these, these types of, uh, you know, like accept those roles? Or is it, you know, what's the, the – obviously there must be a systemic problem yeah, that, yeah. that says – Oh, a professor is this. It's yeah, a yeah, it's yeah. an old white guy with a beard yeah, and yeah, a, an yeah. old tweed jacket yeah. and a, like how do yeah. we how do we break those down so the more opportunities are created for yeah. more diverse groups? Right. So you know what? Here here is a, a perspective that you know you just spoke to this perspective and I noticed that our funding agencies have this perspective. For example, National Science Foundation has this where you want to create something that can be tr- that can be transferred somewhere else. 
right? You know, how do we, what's the approach we have that can be transferred somewhere else? Well, you know what? When I think about that, there's a reason why Popovich has won so many NBA finals. He's been so successful, right? All the coaches have all the access to the same data, but being a great coach and getting something out of people is unique to that individual, right? It's not a system that can be translated to somewhere or the other. So the first thing I notice is that I see all these people that are great coaches that are committed. As I go around the world, I see all these like committed educators and all these little nooks and crannies that are so effective at turning people around. But when it comes to like expanding on what they're doing, you apply for these grants and all this sort of thing. You're not connected. Your essay isn't as good as the next person's, right? And so you don't get it. So, for example, my PhD advisor, my PhD advisor is one of the first five African-American astronomers and astrophysicists. And at one time, he was the only person who had produced more than one African-American astronomer and astrophysicist. Was it Gates? No, no. Oh, no, no. Gates is a, is a physicist, not an astrophysicist. Oh, it's, gotcha. it's Art Walker. Almost nobody knows of the guy. He was a Stanford professor, right? And so, but toward the end of his career, he started applying for grants for education outreach. He didn't win any of them. For a large portion of my career, every year I applied for such grants. And I also have produced, you know, I produce a small army of people, right? But I can't get the grants. And I'm looking at these people who had never produced two, and I already had, right? And I'm like, who's evaluating my application and thinking that they know? And, you know, I shouldn't get this to produce these people. So whatever I write really ain't the point, right? The point is, I've done it. I know how to do it. Maybe I, I can't write it well. Maybe you don't believe in the system, but look at the result. It actually does work, but that doesn't fly. You know, so I think the whole idea of, of identifying. So let me give you an example. Another guy is this guy named Charles Magruder in Western Kentucky University. He was another of the first five African-American astronomers. So South Africa is the African nation that is at the world class level of astronomy and astrophysics and has been so from the beginning. Right. From the Herschels. Right. And uh, so what happened, though, is that most of their astronomers were actually British historically. And so after 1994, after the end of apartheid and, and you know, change of, of everything, uh, the government said, listen, we love what you're doing, but you need to start making some native astronomers. And our main pool of people are the black students. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a huge percentage of the country. But what would happen, just like America has the historically black colleges, South Africa has what they call historically underprivileged colleges. OK. And so these students would graduate their college, go to the University of Cape Town, which is one of the best universities in the world, and they would flunk out. Right. So Charles said, I know what their problem is. It's not academics. It's this identity thing. It's this. So it's these social elements. And at the time, I was the only graduate of a historically black college. And also, like me and other fellow black astronomers, we joke that I was the only black astronomer that you could tell is black on the phone. Right. We would, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're like, Hakeem. You know, you've already done it. So Charles is like, partner with me, and let's go in here and, and, and change this. So we were funded by the Kellogg Foundation. They gave us a half million dollars, right? And it was a grant to the National Society of Black Physicists. So we went there, and these students had to take certain exams and certain courses. And they said, okay, do you want to teach this particular course, this particular course, this particular course? And I said, I'm not teaching any of those courses. I'm going to teach them either cosmology or quantum field theory. And they're like, huh? I'm like, yeah. And here's why. Because those are considered the apex of physical thought. And when I teach it to them, they're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And when they get it and realize how well they understand it, they're going to realize that they can get anything. Right? So, you know, when you get money from someone, you have to give a report on what you did with the money. And so we have this plot that is amazing. It is the plot of the percentage of uh, students in their PhD program that are from, you know, this black community. And it's flat for like years and years and years, like over a decade. It's flat. It's this incredibly low percentage. And then we start in there in 2008 and then it just rises just suddenly. Right. And so the first two groups of students that I taught, I go, I went back not only that. So everyone would fail out when they had to take this exam called the honors exam. Not only did they all pass the honors exams, they all passed in the top 20%. That's amazing. Right. That's amazing. And so now you may know that South Africa won this big contest to, 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 um, to host a square kilometer array, this giant 
uh, radio telescope, right? And so there were all these stories, news stories on CNN International about the SKA, and they would show people in the in the control room, and it would be my students. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, man, that is the coolest thing ever. But of course, you know, once you're successful, they no longer need you, right? It's like being a revolutionary oh, leader, right? right? right of course. Now you're done. So I haven't. Thank been you, a, thank you, yeah, thank we, you. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Got, we get it now. Job accomplished. Now we got it. Right? But you yeah. must you must feel the emotional reward. I do. Of, I'm like that is oh, that is God. that is that is amazing. That's life changing. That's world changing. That's I mean, that's exactly. You know, yeah. these 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 people could go on to answer and so many are. of these questions and they are they are going to do that right and they are doing that i mean it, it's you basically it's as, as we're sort of coming around and wrapping this up your approach to teaching them was exactly how you learned which was you didn't give them limitations on well there's a hierarchy that you have to follow it's just yeah. like you went right to special relativity yeah. when you were 10 years old then with these students you went right to the you know to cosmology and uh, yeah. and field theory and and didn't tell them that that was too much for them. You were like, yeah, you, I just need to Oh, they knew it was to too you. much. And you know what happens? <laughs> I walk in the room, and I do this to my students all the time. I'll say, how many of you believe in the Big Bang, right? Nobody raises their hand. Then I'm like, how many of you disbelieve in the Big Bang? Because I, I ended up teaching them cosmology. Everybody raises their hand. I'm like, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Now, let's learn some cosmology. And then you ask that question at the end of the class. It's not a matter of belief. They learn that, right? Because I tell them it was a trick question to start out with. And they're like, yeah, this obviously this is what happened. This is what I know. The small, smaller, hotter, denser is it's, it's without question. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really, really, really hope you consider doing a series of Facebook live chats because I think it would allow you to affect people from communities all over the world. Uh, and and I and it's so important. And I say this to you and I say this to anyone listening, but you know, it's particularly with science or, or STEM or, or, or communication is the key and yeah. learning, you know, it's not that a lot of students can't understand things. It's just that maybe you haven't figured out what their language is yet. Yeah. So, so take the time. And if you're a student, do extra work. Yeah. You or know? maybe it's you. Maybe, maybe they're not going to listen to you because you're you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. very possible. Yeah. But, you know, I've said this a million times on the podcast before, but one of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard was uh, from a book that I, uh, an audio book that I listened to called Goals by a guy named Brian Tracy, and I, I recommend it to people. And he said his life changed when he was in high school because there was something written on his wall that said, uh, on the school wall that said, uh, What will you do? What are you prepared to do? after you do all that you're required to do. Ooh. So in other words, don't just yeah. do the minimum. Like, right. what are you going to do beyond that yeah. to achieve greatness? Because there's a lot of power. There's a lot of power in that. That is. And there is there is rebellion in that. And yeah. you can shake up the world in that yeah. way. So uh, people should absolutely, absolutely watch Outrageous Acts of Science on the Science Channel. And then How the Universe Works is the other. Is That's the, right. Yeah. How the Universe Works. Yep, yep. Yep. And if you have a young kid, I just partnered with Discovery and uh, Scout Books to put out a book called... Um, Spacepedia, the guide to everything space. We just published that at the end of last year. So get it for your little eight-year-olds and six-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 22-year-olds. And 50-year-olds <laughs> and 70-year-olds and, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and seven, 70 year old yeah. guys in cowboy hats. <laughs> That's right. Man, I love it. I, I yeah. love your astrophysics. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big cosmology fan. Yeehaw. Yeah, right. But uh, uh, And then follow, follow Hakeem on Twitter. And then, you know, if you are an educator, and yeah, I, reach out and, and right. find out how you can how you can – change science in your I mean how you can change the view of science in your own community but thank you so much it's a really honor to, to meet you, you and me. I wish you the best of everything and please please come back and let us know how everything's going definitely all thank right you thanks so much. enjoy your burrito everyone now leaving nerdist.com enjoy your burrito <laughs>